Hey Classroom Hatchery television viewers, welcome to episode 3 of our program. To kick off today's episode, we're going to hear some very important fish information from my son, Leaf. Where do the fish take their money? In the little bank. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that joke. Leaf tells it way better than I do. I included Leaf today because we're going to be learning about Atlantic salmon life stages and the Atlantic salmon life cycle. Leaf is at the life stage of kid. I'm at the life stage of adult. He, being my son, is part of the next generation from me in the continuation of the human life cycle. Let's check on our hatcheries and then learn more about the Atlantic salmon life cycle. So starting with tank one, our filter is running. You can actually see the bubbles floating on the top coming out of the air stone. So our air pump is running and our temperature is sitting right where we want it, right at our target of 4 degrees Celsius. All right, I'm checking on our eggs in tank number one and I'm using a magnifying glass to do this just to help us see the eggs a bit. And once again, we don't see any change in the eggs. Still our eyed eggs. And there aren't any that have turned white. They're looking healthy. These ones are good. Tank number one is good. Checking on hatchery number two. First off, we have this foam floating on the top of the water. If I didn't know any better, I'd be concerned that something has gone wrong. It almost looks like someone dumped in a bunch of dish soap. But I do know better, because I've seen this before, and I know that this is the outer part of the eggs, known as membranes. There's only one event that will cause the membranes to float to the surface, and that is our fish have hatched. We can now clearly see their heads, tails, and yolk sacs. We now have Elvin in hatchery number two. They are very fragile at this stage. In the wild, they would be staying still in the protection of the red, growing from the nutrition in their yolk. We'll leave them for at least another two weeks before we release them from the condo into the rest of the tank. You can also see that there are some eggs that have turned snow white. These eggs have died. This is normal and happens in the natural environment as well. Some eggs just are not designed for survival. We can't let the excitement of our hatching event make us forget to make sure the rest of the equipment is functioning properly. So let's check the regular stuff. The filter and air pump are running, and our temperature is 7 degrees Celsius. Things are great with our hatcheries. Atlantic salmon adults can get quite large. Sandy here, the largest Atlantic salmon caught in Lake Ontario in recent times, weighed 11 kilograms and was 89 centimeters long. Atlantic salmon found in the ocean can get even bigger. The largest one on record was 170 centimeters long. That's almost as long as I am tall. Like all organisms, Atlantic salmon go through a life cycle. A life cycle is simply the series of changes in the life of an organism, which includes reproduction, to start the cycle over again. You may be familiar with the life cycle of a butterfly. The butterfly starts as an egg, hatches into a caterpillar, becomes a chrysalis, and then emerges as an adult butterfly, and then lays eggs to start the cycle over again. For us humans, we start out as a fertilized egg in the womb of our mother, develop into a fetus, then we're born as a baby, develop into a toddler, into a kid, then a teenager, an adult, 
and then maybe we have a child ourselves and start the cycle again. Before we got our eggs, when they were first collected, they didn't have the two little black dots that we now know are the eyes. This was the egg stage. By the time I went and picked them up, their eyes had developed and they had become their next life stage, eyed egg. They are about the size of a pea in both the egg and eyed egg stages. So what other life stages do Atlantic salmon go through between being a little tiny egg and a big adult? Let's learn this from Cat Lucas from Ontario Streams. Hi everyone, I'm Kat and I'm the Outreach Coordinator at Ontario Streams. Ontario Streams is a charity that is trying to fix up all of our local rivers and wetlands here in Ontario. In Ontario, we are very lucky to live right near the Great Lakes. They are the largest fresh water system in the whole world. This fresh water is essential for humans and all living things. Today we are going to be talking about one of those living things and that is Atlantic salmon. They are one of over 150 different kinds of fish that we find here in the Great Lakes. Atlantic salmon are considered locally extinct or extirpated which means that they used to live here in our Great Lakes, however, they don't live here anymore. Many of us though, of course, have eaten Atlantic salmon, so they are not totally extinct like the dinosaurs, just locally extinct. So there's still lots of Atlantic salmon in the Atlantic Ocean. However, the population here in Lake Ontario have been considered locally extinct for over a hundred years due to overfishing and the development of dams. Atlantic salmon in Ontario like to live in cold and clean water with no barriers such as dams. Atlantic salmon go through many changes in their life cycle as they go from an egg to an adult. When we think about humans, when we are babies, we just look like teeny tiny humans. However, with different animals, things like frogs, butterflies and Atlantic salmon, they look different uh, than their adult form. As an egg, Atlantic salmon are bright orange and about the size of a green pea. We can also see that in this stage, they are starting to develop their eyes, which are those little black dots. It will take about eight weeks for this egg to hatch, and all of that depends on the temperature of the water. Once those eggs hatch, we call them alvin. And alvin are about one centimeter long, and they are very small, of course. And as a baby, they are very scared of things like being eaten by other bigger fish. Because these alvin are so small and so scared, and they don't have adults like we do to keep them safe or feed them, they hatch with basically a built-in fridge. This is called a yolk sac, and it has all of the nutrients that these little fish need to get them through the first six months or so of their lives. This way, they can just hide in the gravel and eat all of these nutrients in their built-in fridge until they are big enough to go off and catch their own food. Once they fully absorb that yolk sac, we call the little baby salmon a fry kind of like a french fry, about the same size as a skinny little french fry, about an inch long or so. And at this point, they can go find their own food. They're a little stronger, a little bit bigger. They're ready to see the world. So they will start to find little pieces of life, things like insects in the water, bugs in the water, uh, and they will start to eat lots of those things and start to grow. As they keep growing, they start to develop some new colors and patterns on them. And at that point, we will call them a par. Here is when they start to develop a lot of camouflage so that they can hide better in their rivers. They will continue to keep catching their own food and they will keep growing until we get to a stage called the smolt. And the smolt is like the teenager of the salmon world. This is the point where they will begin their migration. A migration is that 
big journey that some animals make. We think about things like birds and butterflies who fly south in the winter to stay warm and get away from our cold Canadian winters. But in this case, the salmon are now looking for more food. So they will go from these freshwater rivers out to a bigger body of water. So the salmon that live near the oceans will swim all the way out to the oceans. However, the salmon that we have here in Ontario, they will swim out to Lake Ontario and that will be their ocean where it's full of lots of more food for them to eat and keep growing. Once the Atlantic salmon have reached their full size, the adults will swim back to the freshwater rivers where they started their lives and that's where the adults will start their family and begin the life cycle all over again. There are lots of organizations like Ontario Streams working to bring back Atlantic salmon into Lake Ontario. Well, there are two major ways that Ontario Streams works to help our local salmon. One is through habitat restoration. And that means that we are trying to fix up our local rivers to make sure that they are really healthy so that the salmon that live in the rivers are healthy too. The second way that we work to help our Atlantic salmon here is through restocking efforts. And restocking means that we are helping put more baby Atlantic salmon into our local rivers. So by helping build these populations, we're now seeing these little babies slowly grow into adults, which can then have their own uh, babies later in life. One way that we help build the salmon populations is through in-stream incubation. Basically, what we do is we put the little Atlantic salmon eggs into these white tubes and put those tubes into the river. This tube keeps them protected from any larger fish who might want to eat them, as well as protects them from any big changes in weather. Our in-stream incubation research is a lot like your classroom hatchery tanks. In both scenarios, the eggs are being protected. Just like the eggs in the classroom are in those little condos, the eggs in the river are in these tubes. Both are kept in clean, cooled, and clear water, right? That's what our salmon need to grow nice and big and healthy. In the river, the water is naturally moving, which brings in oxygen. And in the classroom tank, we have little bubblers to add oxygen. We use that chiller to keep the water cold and we use a filter to clean the water in those tanks. We take those fish out of the tubes and release them right into the river, just like students are releasing the Atlantic salmon into the rivers in the spring. So both of these are great ways to help our local Atlantic salmon get a good head start on life during those six months uh, when they are just so scared and so vulnerable. Now that we know more about Atlantic salmon, let's think about ways that we can help the nature around us. One thing we can do is our five R's. Maybe we've heard of three of those R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we've got two more to add as well. We have rethink, which is about thinking about the things that we do every day and think about whether those are good for the environment. If they're not so good for the environment, maybe we can think about some different things to do that are better. We also have refuse, which means to say no to those things that are not good for the environment. Maybe next time we go get some takeout for dinner and they try to give us a plastic fork or a plastic straw, we say no thank you and we just wait until we get home and we use the cutlery that we already have. Another thing we can do is save water. The water that we have in our homes comes from our local environment, so we never want to take more than what we need. One thing we can do is to try and take a shorter shower. A shower should be no more than about seven minutes. That should be plenty of time to get everything you need done and save that extra water for the environment. It's also very important not to litter, and I know all of us don't want to be a litter bug, and it's a great idea too if we're out for a walk with an adult and we see some garbage and it's safe, 
we can pick up that garbage and get it out of nature. Hopefully today you've learned a lot more about Atlantic salmon and how we can help them and how you can work with Ontario Streams to try and make the environment even better for everyone. So thank you all for tuning in and I hope you continue to watch the rest of the series of these videos. Thanks for that Kat. Let's review the Atlantic salmon life stages. We have egg, eyed egg, elven, fry, par, smolt, adult, and then spawning adult to lay the eggs and start the life cycle again. Now I'm going to turn it over to Johnny for another fishy fact. This one is about the largest living species of fish in the world. Do you know what species that is? Just so you know, this wasn't filmed this year. So the tank that you'll see behind Johnny with the Atlantic salmon fry swimming around in it isn't from our current eggs. Hello everyone. Thanks for checking out another segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're going to talk about the world's largest cartilaginous fish, the whale shark. As I just said, the whale shark is the world's largest cartilaginous fish, reaching lengths up to 12 meters long and weighing over 40,000 pounds. Whale sharks are found in tropical waters across the globe, including the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. Whale sharks prefer warm waters between 21 and 30 degrees Celsius in areas with large amounts of plankton. They are commonly found offshore, but are also often seen near shore where they sometimes congregate to feed. The Red Sea in particular is a hotspot for juvenile whale sharks to congregate and feed together. Most sharks have subterminal mouths that are located on the underside of their head. Whale sharks differ by having terminal mouths that are located at the front of their head. This is because unlike most other sharks, whale sharks are filter feeders and they have large mouths that can be up to 1.4 meters wide. They typically feed on krill, shrimp, plankton, fish eggs, jellyfish, or small fish like anchovies or sardines. They have over 300 rows of tiny teeth and 20 filter pads which help to filter small food particles from the water. Unlike other filter feeders, whale sharks will actively suck large amounts of water into their mouth. The water is expelled through the gills while food particles are sifted through the filter pads. Food items build up in a spinning ball at the back of the whale shark's throat until they are swallowed. Some particles may become trapped in the gills and whale sharks will cough to free any stuck particles. Whale shark tourism has become a popular industry in some countries including Mexico, Belize, the Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, Mozambique and Tanzania. The industry generates millions of dollars each year and serves as an important economic boost to these countries for local operators. However, there are ethical concerns about the effects this may have on whale sharks. For example, biologists worry hand feeding of whale sharks in places like the Philippines may lead to whale sharks developing abnormal behaviors or experiencing harmful physiological effects as a result. Globally, whale sharks are listed as endangered and their populations are threatened due to entanglement in fishing nets, boat strikes, ingestion of plastics, and poaching. Whale sharks are sometimes harvested for their oil, which is used as a waterproofing material, or for their meat and fins, which are highly valued. Although many countries have banned the harvest of whale sharks, a lucrative black market fishery and shark fin market still exists. Well, that's all I have for you guys in this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I hope you enjoyed learning about the world's largest cartilaginous fish,
the whale shark. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks again, Johnny. Next week, we're going to be joined by another one of our OFAH Fitzsimmons Fish and Wildlife Conservation interns, Elizabeth Gallant. Elizabeth is going to be teaching us about Atlantic salmon habitat. Until then, keep on swimming upstream. <laughs>